Today, Pastor Peter Chen will be preaching from Nehemiah 10, 28 to 33. My name is Irene, and I will read in Somali, and this is Stefan, and he will read in English. Hear the word of the Lord. O datka intisikale, o dan o aha, wadadadi. Yo kui red lawi, yo iri dauriadi, yo kui kabayaga aha. Yo red netinim, yo kuli inti iske so adai. Tad yogi dalka de gana o radai, shariki ila. Yo naga hodi, yo vila shodi, yo kaba hodi. O mit kasta, o laha akun, yo wahkara sho. Wahai raen, wala la hodi, koptozi aha. O wahai galendar habarle. Ine kuso onengan, shariga ila a, o loso dibei. Muse o aha adonki ila, io inai darwayan, o wadal yeleyan, amarada rabika a, sayit kena, io hu kumadisa, io kainunadisa. Io inenan, kabadena, sinain, dat yoga dalka degan, o inain, kabahadona, wilashena u gurinen. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, musicians, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who are able to understand. All these now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our Lord. We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us, or take their daughters for our sons. Io hadi dat yoga dalka de ganu, ai malinta saptida kenan wah yalo iba. Io unto un ininan ipsanain malinti saptida io malin kudu satona, io inan sanada Todobad beraha taino o kan kasta samahno. O elba wahainu samasane amaro inagu hukumea inainu sanat kasta shekel sadeh dal tolkis upiheno adagida guriga ilahena das oa. Kibisti tusninta io kurbanka hadutka o jogtoda a, io kurbanka laguvo o jogtoda a, io kan sabtiada, io kan bilaha usub. Iokan idahala amre, Iokan wahyalaha, kuduska ah, Iokurpanada denbigasi, kafarogud logu, sameyo red bino Israel, Iokuli waha, lo sameyo guriga ila odan. When the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. Every seventh year we will forego working the land and will cancel all debts. We assume the responsibility for carrying out the commands to give a third of a shekel each year for the service of the house of our God. For the bread set out on the table, for the regular grain offerings and burnt offerings, for the offerings on the Sabbaths, at the new moon feasts, and at the appointed festivals, for the holy offerings, for sin offerings to make atonement for Israel, and for all duties of the house of our God. This, this is the, the word, word of the Lord. Lord. Good morning again, everyone. Um, what we'll be doing today is finishing up a very brief sermon series where we are processing the pandemic together through Scripture. And we kind of mean all of those words very intentionally. We are processing, so we're not giving answers about how you should feel, but just kind of creating space for us to think about um, things coming out of the pandemic. We want to do this together. There's definitely some things that we have to do by ourselves in terms of thinking about our lives as we come out of that season, but I think there's something that we could also be thinking about together as a community, and that's part of our priority. And then lastly, we want to look through Scripture. That's kind of the lens through which we're trying to examine this. There's a lot of wisdom out there about how we can be thinking about things, but our lens as a faith community is really going to be the Bible, and so that's what we're doing for this time. Um, just as a review of what we talked about in the past month or so, the first week we talked about Ezra chapter 3. And what we said was um, the scripture we're using is the return of the people of Judah from exile. So they're conquered by the Babylonians and the Babylonians send them into exile. They live there for 70 years. And then suddenly King Darius of the Persians decides, no, you can go back. And then everyone kind of goes back to normal. 
And I think that feels very similar to us after the pandemic, where everything got turned upside down. We couldn't go to restaurants or anything like that. And suddenly, I don't know who decided, but it was just over and kind of here we are. And so it feels very similar to what we might read in Ezra and Nehemiah. In Ezra chapter 3, we read about the people of Judah returning back and they're setting the foundations of the temple which had been destroyed and a great cry goes out. You can imagine at a big event, people just start shouting. But what Ezra notes is that the shouting was not just shouts of joy, it was shouts of joy and mourning at the same time. So much so they couldn't tell the difference between the two. And I think that what teaches us is that as we return back from the pandemic, we're going to feel all sorts of ways. We're not going to feel all the same way when we come back. There's going to be some conflict. There's going to be some confusion. We won't all feel identically. And that kind of is a little awkward for us when we're trying to process something, something together. If you feel really happy that we're out of it and other people are still mourning something, we don't know how to kind of deal with that. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have an example from Scripture in the book of Psalms, though. Because when you read the book of Psalms, you don't read things that always make sense. Psalms are often confusing and conflicted. They have a lot of different emotions and feelings when you read through the Psalms. And what that does is it gives us permission to feel all kinds of ways. We don't have to be in agreement about how we feel about things. Some of us can be mourning things. Some of us can be joyful about it at the same exact time. And God gives us more permission to feel different ways than we often give ourselves. And I think that can be really powerful for us during times when we're processing something. Two weeks ago, we talked about Nehemiah chapter 9. And that's where the people of Judah are gathering together. And this time, they're rededicating the wall. They're preparing to rebuild the wall. And as they do that, they take some time to think. And you would think as, as they're returning back from exile, their focus would really be on the Babylonians. Because the Babylonians had caused the exile. The Babylonians had conquered them. And so they should be thinking to themselves, it's all because of the Babylonians that were sitting in such disgrace. And they'd be calling on curses on the Babylonians. But in Nehemiah chapter 9, what we find is that when Israel returned from exile, they focused on their own actions on not the actions of others. In a moment where they definitely could have been focused on what other people had done, And how other people had caused their pain. Instead, they were looking in the mirror and looking at their own actions and their own mentalities instead. And I think that's a good word for us. Because I think we spent a good portion of the pandemic, really all of us, very externally focused. Kind of really thinking about other people and what they were doing. You'd walk into a room and you're kind of looking at what other people were doing. Were they masks? Were they six feet apart? Kind of for three years straight, so focused on the actions and the behaviors of other people. Did they say this on social media or did they not say it in social media? And so we had kind of developed this tendency to always be looking at other people and what other people were doing. And I think as we emerge from the pandemic, this is a great time for us to stop doing that. And instead, to look at ourselves and to ask questions about ourselves on our own behaviors and our own mentalities instead. Because ultimately, when it comes down to it, that's the only thing we could control. We never could control what other people were doing during the pandemic. Whether they wore a mask or not or got vaccinated or were five feet apart or three, that was always beyond our control. The only thing we had control during those years was ourselves. And that's why our focus should really be on ourselves. What kind of attitude did we have? What kind of mentalities, what kind of emotions did we have during that season? And that's why I think it's an appropriate thing for us to imitate the people of God in Nehemiah chapter 9. We're going to keep on going and go right to Nehemiah chapter 10. And in Nehemiah chapter 10, what was read today by Irene and Stephan is that the people of Judah, they rededicate themselves to the law. And to various actions that they should be doing. And what I wanted to do is just kind of run through a few of the things that they are recommitting themselves to. In verse 30, they're recommitting themselves not to marry from other nations, which is part of kind of the Old Testament, what the Old Testament commanded them to do. In verse 31, they are honoring the Sabbath. They're celebrating the Jubilee and canceling debts in verse 31 as well. 
In an earlier chapter, they also commit themselves to not charging interest any longer. And this is kind of a big portion of chapter 5. And I just wanted to take a moment to do that. And so there were people who were in poverty in the nation of Judah. And they were trying to get themselves out of it. And so people would lend their possessions to them and lend them things in order to get them out of that time. But what they discovered is that people were actually charging interest on top of that lending. And as a result of that, those people who are trying to get out of poverty would get deeper and deeper and deeper. Because if you're trying to ask someone for help to get out of that situation and they keep charging you more and more each time, of course you're not going to be able to get out of it. And so Nehemiah called them out and said, hey, in the book of Leviticus, it tells you not to charge interest. Why are you charging poor people interest? And so they recommitted themselves in chapter 5 to no longer doing that. And the reason I bring that up is that's a core feature of free Methodism. Because B.T. Roberts hated it when Christians would charge interest to other Christians. Because he would argue, hey, if you're trying to help someone who's in a jam who doesn't have enough money, why would you keep on charging them money on top of that? And that is something that we as Christians in American society have just accepted as par for the course. That it's completely acceptable for us to make money as we help people out of poverty. And I'm going to just put that out there as a challenge to us. Why do we do that? Why do we lend money to people to get them out of a tough place expecting that we'll make more money on top of it? Why don't we just give it so they can get better and get themselves out of the situation? I'll just put that out there for us to think about. On top of that, they're recommitting themselves to tithing in verse 33 and then in verse 34 to offering the appropriate sacrifices um, at the appropriate times. It's all of the kind of different laws of the Old Testament. So it seems like in Nehemiah chapter 10 that when they returned from exile, the people of Judah seem to be recommitting themselves to the laws of the Old Testament, right? They come back and they say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do all the appropriate things that we should be doing as the people of Judah. But really, that's just the surface. That's just kind of what's going on the surface because there's a deeper understanding of what these laws really were. They weren't just actions. They represented something far deeper. We get a sense of it from Leviticus chapter 20 when it says this. You must therefore make a distinction between clean and unclean animals and between unclean and clean birds. Do not defile yourselves by any animal or bird or anything that moves along the ground, those that I have set apart as unclean for you. And so this is just God talking about those same laws, saying you've got to make sure you're doing these laws, these things that are clean and unclean, and pay attention to them. But then he explains why in the next verse. And he says, You are to be holy to me, because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. And so here God gives a, a kind of a deeper reason as to why they obey the laws of Moses. They don't just obey the laws of Moses to do it. They obey the laws of Moses because that represents who they are. It's a reflection of their identity as the people of God. And that's what the law really was. Even kind of the clean and unclean laws of what they ate and what they didn't eat. Scholars and actually dietitians have gone through those laws, those kosher regulations, trying to figure out if maybe kosher food is just better for you. And that's the reason why God would say, hey, you should eat kosher food because that's really better for you. And dietitians have gone through those things, and there are some things that are less healthy for you that are not kosher, like pork. Sorry for those of you who love bacon. Pastor Fred, I think about your, uh, your suggestion that we swap out the communion elements with bacon, and I don't think that's really a good idea. But dietitians have decided, no, there's not really anything that's better about kosher food than non-kosher food. So why does God do that? He does it just to say, you're different. You're doing this not because it makes sense, not because this food is better for you or worse for you, but merely because you are set apart. This is your identity. That's what the laws of Moses were. They were a reflection of their identity as a separate, holy, chosen people of God. And that's why they did these laws. That's why they performed these actions, because it reflected their identity. Through that, we get a better understanding of what they're really doing in Nehemiah chapter 10. That the people of Judah were not just recommitting themselves to a list of actions. They were recommitting themselves to being the people of God. That's really what's happening in that passage that was read today. They're not just saying we're going to do A, B, and C. They're saying we are recommitting ourselves to what it means to be the chosen people of God. That's really what they're saying when they're committing themselves to the actions. And the question we can ask in that situation is why? Why do they have to do that? 
Why was it so important for them to recommit themselves to their identity in that moment? Why did they have to kind of remember what it meant to be God's people? And the reason is this. They had to recommit to their identity as God's people because that is exactly what had been lost during the exile. During the exile, we kind of think about all the things that happened to them. It's helpful to kind of remember what set apart the people of Judah and the people of Israel, the people of God. One thing was definitely their location. It was the city of Jerusalem. It's hard to express how important the city of Jerusalem and the temple was to the Jewish people at that time period. If you were a Jew and you were faithful to worshiping, what you had to do is if you lived far away, you would come to Jerusalem to worship because that was the only place you could really worship God and you could only do it in the temple. It was core to their identity, the city of Jerusalem living in that geography. In addition, it was the Jewish culture and the laws. It was so central. Like we said today, it wasn't just things that they did. It was a reflection of who they were. Every time they did these laws and they obeyed it, it was a way of saying, this is who I am. I am the people of this law. And they were also kind of known as a chosen people of God. This is kind of how they understood themselves. But during the exile, all these core elements of their identity as the people of God started to get diluted and started to get fractured in so many different ways. First off, there was destruction of the temple. The temple that they worshipped in, that they would kind of strive to, to be close to in order to worship God, was absolutely destroyed. You can kind of imagine what they would have, that would have done to their identity. And then not only that, they're picked up out of Jerusalem into this place that is so centered to who they are, and now they have to live in Babylon, in Persia instead. On top of that, they don't just live there. They're commanded to live by Babylonian culture and laws. And we know in the book of Daniel, they had to change their names. They had to eat different food. They had to live according to different laws and standards on top of that. Even when they returned back to Jerusalem, there was a group of people who had remained in that land who said, you guys aren't the chosen people of God. We're the chosen people of God. That the Samaritans lay claim to what it really meant to be God's people. And so when they returned back from the exile, essentially they didn't know who they were anymore. The temple had been destroyed. They weren't living in Jerusalem during that entire time. And they had been living with Babylonian culture and influences for 70 years. And then they come back and there's a group of people who are saying, you don't even know what it means. We're the chosen people of God. You are not any longer. And so when they came back, they had to remember, wait, who are we? After this exile, after 70 years, we don't even remember who we are. And that's why they had to recommit themselves to the law because they were recommitting themselves to what it meant to be the people of God. That the Babylonian exile didn't just affect the practices of the people of Judah, it affected their very identity. This is not the only time that when you see the people of God returning from an exile and they kind of forget who they are. That the exile is a kind of a time of amnesia where it picks apart the very core of their identity. The other time is another kind of exile, and that's where the people of God are wandering in the desert, right? A, a, a prolonged time where they're not where they want to be, right? The wilderness represents that. And so they're wandering in the wilderness after they've been enslaved in Egypt, and they finally get back to their promised land. They finally get back to Canaan. And so this is what Joshua says to them in Joshua 24. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the God your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the God of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And so we see the same exact thing happening, right? They return back after a prolonged time of exile and they've kind of forgotten who they are. They don't even know who they worship. And so Joshua has to kind of confront them and say, hey, who do you really serve? Do you serve the God who brought you all the way through the wilderness or do you serve the gods who are here right now? Because I don't think you guys even know anymore. And so this is the truth that we get from Scripture, that when we go through an exile, when you go through a prolonged time where you're separated and you're not where you are, then oftentimes what will happen is that you've probably lost some part of your identity. The people of Judah did when they were in Babylon. The people of Israel did when they were in the wilderness. And just kind of what happens, who we are starts to get picked apart and diluted over that time of exile. And the reason I bring this up is not just for us to understand biblical history better. It's really for us to be thinking about ourselves. 
And something I want us to consider is this, that our own time of exile didn't just affect our habits and practices, it also affected our sense of identity. I think when we're thinking about the pandemic and everything that happened, we tend to focus on the things that we couldn't do. And we couldn't go, you know, to large events. And we couldn't gather in small groups with people. We had to wear masks. We had to get vaccines and all these different things. And that's kind of the extent of what we think really affected us. That our habits and the things we did or couldn't do got affected. And that's really all that the pandemic really did. It just affected kind of the the things that we might do. But when I think about the pandemic, I really think about it as affecting our understanding of who we are. That I think our self-perception and the things that are important to us and identified us really changed all throughout the pandemic, especially our identity as Christians and what it meant to be Christ followers. I just want to kind of clarify, this is just my opinion. This is kind of what I think about when I think about the pandemic. You can think about something very differently. But this is kind of what I've stumbled upon when I reflect upon it in my own life. That for me, kind of the main core of, of how I see myself is really as a follower of Jesus. There's a lot of other parts of who I am, but that's kind of the center. And that takes up a lot of kind of my self-perception and who I am as being a follower of Jesus. And I, I would assume for many of us as Christians, that's probably the same, right? We want that to be the main kind of thing that identifies us as believers, as being followers of Jesus. But one thing that I recognized during the pandemic is that other parts of our lives that previously were very small and not just maybe opinions more than anything else, She kind of got larger and became ideologies. Things that maybe were just like influential in our lives actually became part of our identity instead. So let me give you one example. Let's talk about masks, right? I hate to bring it up, but let's just talk about masks for a moment. Did any of you before the pandemic have a lot of vested interest in masks? Was part of your identity whether you wore a mask or whether you didn't wear a mask? Probably for most of us, no. Unless maybe you're a surgeon or something. Most of us, it was a very small part of who we were, whether we wore a mask or didn't, right? But during the pandemic, what happened? It became big. It became a big part of how we saw ourselves and how we represented ourselves in public. It became a big part of how we identified other people. We could see them, and the second we saw them wearing or not wearing a mask, we saw them in a different light. This thing that previously was such a tiny, if not invisible part of our lives, became kind of a part of who we were during the pandemic, crowding out kind of our understanding of who we were. The same thing with vaccines. I think vaccines maybe we have a slightly stronger opinion on, but I would venture a guess that most of us did not base our identity before the pandemic on vaccines. I don't know, maybe you are. Maybe you're an epidemiologist and you're like, no, I love vaccines and that's a big part. For most of us, we're like, yeah, I get vaccines when I need to. I don't even know what I have or what, you know, that kind of stuff. Wasn't that big of a deal. It became a bigger deal, right? During the pandemic, it became a much bigger deal. That became like a way to identify someone. Oh, you're someone who did? You're someone who didn't? It became kind of a marker for us. In fact, I've heard this is true. There are some people who mistrusted the COVID vaccine so much, they won't allow any vaccines in their lives, even for their pets. And right now, you'll find there's a steady uptick in the counts of rabies around us right now because people won't even get their pets vaccinated. Vaccines have now become part of their identity, right? Whether you do it or you don't do it is now a big part of who you are. We saw the politics, absolutely. All of us have you know, political opinions. There's not political opinions anymore. There's no such thing as an opinion. You have a political identity. That's who you are. Before the pandemic, you could sit down at a Thanksgiving dinner with someone who voted for a different presidential candidate. Man, was that hard during the pandemic because this was an identity now. Geographically, this took place as well. I don't know if this happened to anyone else, but during the pandemic, I had people call me who lived in other parts of the country and they would say, hey, what is going on in Seattle? It's like a war zone. Are you okay? They would legitimately ask me, like, are you okay? Are you safe? And I'd be looking out my window and like, what is going on? Like, things are fine here. But this sense, like, if you live in Seattle, you live in a war zone. Unless we feel a different way, how did we feel in Seattle about Texas? Come on, let's be honest here. 
You, are you guys okay in Texas? We're hearing some things about there. But all these different things that before were just kind of, you know, smaller opinions or influences during the pandemic, they got big. And they started to take so much of how we identified ourselves or identified other people throughout this time. So much so that this understanding of ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ started getting crowded out and picked apart by other influences that started getting bigger and stronger and like black holes would pick apart the identity of who we were as Christians. These are all kind of, if in that picture, you can imagine them as kind of black holes that are just kind of taking away a little more and a little more of who we are as followers of Jesus. If we need evidence of that, I think there's no clear evidence than the rise of two groups. And that's the rise of Christian nationalists and the rise of the nuns. And I don't mean N-U-N-S, the N-O-N-E-S, right? Not the Catholic um, servants, but the people who have no affiliation with religion. Right? There are, those are two different groups. The first is Christian nationalists, people who feel like um, patriotism and being a Christian go hand in hand. That if you're a Christian, you should be a patriot. Right? That's one group that has risen in number significantly. 50% of identified Republicans now openly identify as Christian nationalists. That we should be patriots on top of being Christians. 50% of Republicans. The nuns are people who have, they don't want anything to do with religion at all. They're done, right? Nothing to do with religion whatsoever. That's now 30% of the American population. It was 18% 10 years ago. It has gone up by 12 percentage points, almost, not quite, but almost double in 10 years, right? And those groups have grown astronomically during the last five years or so. And the question is why? How did this happen? Why, what happened that would pick apart their Christian identity? That would take followers of Jesus and instead make them national followers of Jesus? That would take a follower of Jesus and then they would have no identity in Christ whatsoever? And so you see what happens. All the other identities start to pick it apart and start to fracture it in so many different ways. To me, that's why those groups have grown so much during this time is because the pandemic, like any exile, has fractured our understanding of who we are. And I think that's something that we have to recognize. And it's also something that we have to address as well. That coming out of our exile, this is a time for us to recommit ourselves to our identity as followers of Jesus. Many of us probably don't even recognize it. But coming out of the pandemic, our understanding of who we are as followers of Jesus is probably a more diluted than it was before. We can't see it. There's no like barometer or thermometer that tells you, oh yeah, you're 17% less Christian than you were before. But if scripture is telling us the truth, when we emerge from exile, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's my sense. I think even as a pastor, I could tell during the pandemic my identity kind of shooting out in different places that it wasn't before. And I think getting less and less invested in Jesus. And so I think this is something, this is a perfect moment for us to recognize that this might be taking place and to recommit ourselves to being followers of Jesus instead. Yeah. The question is, how do we do that? And I'm just going to advise for us two things. I think there are a lot of different things that we can do. But the first thing that I want us to do together is to remember and recommit ourselves to the commands of Christ. There's something really powerful about just remembering what Jesus said then when we read Jesus' words, there's just a way of it kind of letting everything else fall away into the background. We kind of can see and hear Jesus more clearly. And so in light of this idea of kind of recommitting ourselves to what it means to be followers of Jesus, what I'm going to do is actually just read Jesus' words and kind of letting other things fade away. The other parts of our identity and all the things that we've kind of identified ourselves by in the past few years, that it might kind of fade in the distance. We might hear Jesus' words and commands more clearly. And so I'm just going to invite us to kind of listen and kind of hear, even kind of visualize Jesus and to let the other parts of who we are kind of just fade in the distance as we recenter ourselves on Christ. This is from Luke chapter 4. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. From Matthew chapter 5, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. From Matthew 22, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Matthew 25. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And finally, from John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I think Jesus' words are a powerful way for us. In the same way that the people of Judah just sat and heard the words of the law, this is a way for us to remember this is who we are. And we had so many other authorities and so many other wisdoms that we were hearing from the past few years. And this is a way for us to sit at Jesus' feet and to remember this is what identifies us. These are the commands and the identity that we really truly have. And this is the perfect time for us to recenter ourselves on that identity.